my name is Cassandra Lauren Gordon and I am the host of the Black Creative Handbook Podcast and I'm here with Yao Awusu. Yes, we've totally forgot our names, but it's okay. We're here to give you <laughs> great quality content here. And Yao, just give us a few sentences about what you do. I feel like at my ripe old age now, I'm starting to understand what I do. And I'd say I am a, a creative consultant who designs music projects, events and initiatives. Um, and all really focused on helping those who don't normally get a shot or people may think won't have a shot at success. And I'm here to help with their creative ambitions and help them realise them. I think you've been a bit modest, Yao, because, you know, just reading and doing research about what you do, you know, as you said, you are a creative consultant, the head of the Playmaker Group, but we'll talk about later. You are motivated to work with people underrepresented and you, you heads up the award-winning Liverpool International Music Festival Academy, a senior manager of PRS Foundation Power Up Initiative, you have done so many things like with BBC and One Extra and been producing. So I, I just wanted to make sure that we really big you up about what you do no, here no, in these I, music I, and creative streets. So, yeah. No, I appreciate that. I really do. I really do. Like to me, it's, it's, it feels like for the, I've been doing stuff for like 16 years and I feel like I've always kind of done the same thing. And some things have been on bigger scales, some things more, localized more some things international but I think to me it's it, it is in that realm like I you know I, I realize I am a creative consultant I like working on projects where this this challenge I like feeling like I'm working with or for an underdog type of project or initiative um or representing underdogs because I find that really interesting I find it and, and I like the fact that I've done bits of everything you know I've managed artists I've consultancy with major labels i've released music independently i've produced content independently i've produced content for large platforms and it totally gives you um, a very different perspective i think and i think bringing that to the table is, is, has kind of put me in some really interesting spaces and places i really want to explore that about how you've navigated um through these different um I would say streams are different, you know, making these partnerships because sometimes as a black creative or just as creative, it's just you don't know where to start. Like, how do you increase your social capital? How do you increase your networks and stuff like that? So that's really interesting. But before we get into the Playmaker Group and all of your great creative consulting, I we just want to know the person because people are people. You're human. You're a human being, and we need to know you. So I hear a bit of an accent. So um, yeah. usually who are people, you know, I, I've got an accent um, for the people who are in America, like what kind of, you got a British accent, but in England, you have so many regional accents. It gives yeah. a bit of a way of your identity. So do you want to talk about your lovely accent that people might talk about all the time? I'm from, um, I'm from Liverpool. I'm still based in Liverpool, which is Northwest of, of England. Um, obviously Liverpool's got a long history, a well-known history ship and port a uh, uh, city of music obviously a city well known for sports especially liverpool football club who have had tremendous success and obviously in it back in that space but you know home of the beatles home of the real thing the christians zootons the laws the maybe you know there's loads so you know yeah I'm, I've, I've been blessed to, to to grow up in liverpool with everything that comes with it the hardships the challenges the you know the benefits um but yeah, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to stay here and build my family and my career here. And um, yeah, I, I've just been one of the lucky ones because it's not that necessarily that way for everyone who wants to get into music or a black people who want to get into the creative arts full stop. Yeah, and um, the reason why I want to talk about the Liverpool because um, I shared off camera or offline that um, I used to live in Liverpool for three years and Liverpool has a very special place in my heart for different reasons and I might go off topic. I just love the people, just so honest, just so honest and just so friendly. I'm, talk I'm talkative. I'm very sure you realise that when you come, <laughs> like taxi drivers, pe random people on the street will speak to you, like, the, like your family, which is, I think is a bit shocking, especially when Londoners come up. 
for the first time. I think that sometimes throws them if they're in a taxi and the taxi driver starts trying to bond with them. Yeah, absolutely. And so helpful. Yeah, I they always have a special place in my heart. And also the girls, like the women or oh, and the men, they're so glamorous. They're well, so glamorous. I bet you really, isn't it? The girls dress up like the girls. Like I think the men are getting there now. But maybe when you were in, you said you're around 08 times. The get, but the girls have always, like if they're going out to the a bar on a random Wednesday or they're going to the shops, they will doll themselves up to a high a high level especially even if you say oh no it's a casual thing they'll still come like it's like yeah it's a week-long prep thing do you know what I mean and I think that's quite interesting um and we've got more women than men in Liverpool so it's, I think, oh. I think that's why I think that's why so so many damn fighting in in our city on, on okay I just Saturday. thought it was like the the derbies like I remember when you know if Everton or Liverpool are playing I'm like I'm saying it, I'm saying it in my house oh yeah <laughs> yeah that's not the best night to go out. and I'm not a foot like I used to be into football when I was young, but I, I haven't I, I haven't really followed it for like the last 20 years, apart from superficially, I suppose. But um, you know when there's a match on, like when it's a feel derby, it. because you, you can feel the air, the air in Liverpool changes. It actually, you can physically feel it. And if you do go out that night, and if it's a draw, it's, it's probably all right. But when one team loses, and it, like there's always something that feels a bit, a bit dangerous, which is a bit odd, but... I suppose there's probably other cities that may understand that from a derby perspective, but I think uh, Liverpool's got a uniqueness. Like, even our clubs, they're like, Everton and Liverpool are, like, separated by a park, so it's only, like, two-mile difference. So they're actually from, they're in the same area, and they used to be the same team. So it's, it's like, it's deeper than that. Like, it's almost like in Liverpool, you have Protestants and Catholic. That's, like, a big split of families, like, they depend on what denomination you are. And Everton and Liverpool, you're blue or a red. It's like families will be split by that. And it's a uh, if you if you're a if you're a red, that's in the Liverpool supporter, and you go up and you decide you're gonna support Everton, that's like you could get kicked out of your family for that. It's, it's a serious, yeah, it's, serious. it's 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 real. This is not talk, and you know, I'm not gonna talk about music, <laughs> but I think I think culture and heritage are very important, and I think Liverpool has its own unique culture, and I feel like in England or the UK, it's just not embraced. You know. Um, you know, it's not just London, you know what I mean? You know, black people are everywhere. It's not just London. And also, you know, it's got history of, you know, the International Slave Museum. I'm not trying to bring it down, but I'm yeah. just saying, you know, into, yeah. you know, there's a it was a big slaving, um, slave um, trading port city. Um, yeah. A lot of wealth. Um, massive, um, like this, this is all, this is all facts. Like Liverpool, first and foremost with Liverpool, what everyone got to understand is if you, if you are a Scouser, a Liverpoolian, and you travel anywhere and someone goes where you're from, Usually, it's like New Yorkers. Usually, the response would be, I'm from Liverpool. We wouldn't say we're from England or the UK. We would say we're from Liverpool. Like, we think Liverpool's as big as the UK. It's its own country. It's its own country. Well, this is is what I'm saying. And this is what New Yorkers do. I think if you meet New Yorkers anywhere in the world, they won't say I'm from America. They'll say I'm from New York. I think that's that's an interesting one. That is the same. And Liverpool, yeah, Liverpool's got a history because of the port. At what point, one point, Liverpool was very, very rich as a city because so much of the trade used to come through here. Pre, this is pre-slavery, I'm talking about just general trade. Um, and one of the stories is Liverpool was so rich at one point that it actually didn't use the same currency as the rest of the country. It printed its own. Um, and because of that, you've got, you know, these massive monuments and these buildings that look like they would be London, but they're in Liverpool in this small city in the northwest of the UK. And I think... That's that. That's why, and also the immigration and migration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we've got a little bit of an attitude about ourselves. Um, we 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 rarely shout to the rooftops to each other how great we are. Um, and we've got a little bit of an edge, and we like to party a lot because of all everyone who came through here. We stop on a ship. I think it's in the blood here. Yeah, people would just party and rave, and it's still like that now. And that's why some of the I suppose the biggest dance brands like cream and stuff like that have came out of liverpool because it's just like it's a party city so so yeah it's a it's a unique space so if you've never been to liverpool i i always urge people to at least come and taste it for one weekend um and as you said it just it'll it probably even if you have to leave or you do leave it'll always have a special place in your heart i'm, I'm sure of that this podcast is sponsored by the Liverpool Tourist Board. <laughs> How much we love <laughs> Liverpool. They're not giving me any money. But I, but you can tell from our hearts, like, I, I always encourage it. 
I don't want to say the M word, meaning Manchester. So this is not this is not even about the podcast. Like there's a this little rivalry of the big like northern towns of Manchester and Liverpool, which is about an hour apart. But you know, my heart, I don't, I can't. My heart's go, my heart because I lived in it. My heart goes with, with Liverpool, but Manchester is a good city. So I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna to go to you now, and I'm gonna ask you just some, you know, want to get to know you. One question I'll ask: What advice would you give to your 16 year old self? What advice would I give to my 16 year old self? Uh-huh. When I was 16, I was really determined to play professional basketball. And I, I was dead focused. I think what so, and and I, and that was as far as I'd seen. I went looking to the side or whatever. But I think if I had to give my advice to my sixteen year old self, I'd say be aware that the, the 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 approach you've got is great, but be aware that you could apply it to anything else in your life and be as as successful in that space as you want to be in basketball. So I, I'd probably be a little bit aware because I was so tunneled visioned with basketball at that time that I was, um, I think I probably didn't realize, even like my culture, like my dad's from Ghana, my mom's from Jamaica. I had this, you know, wonderful family unit, but I was, I, I cut, no, I wouldn't say I cut a lot. I didn't pay attention to a lot of the, the blessings and opportunities around me. Cause I was so like, I want to do this. So I, I think that's the thing I'd say is just like, you know, be aware of what's around and know that, you know, if this thing doesn't work out, you can apply that same energy and same approach to other things and be be um, be successful. Oh, that's really nice. That's a really nice touch to that. I never I never thought about that when I'm 16. Just like just pass your juice scenes, get through that <laughs> and see what happens. But yeah, yeah it's good. I went, it's good. I went like, yeah. Okay. So yeah. next question I was, I was good in school. Okay. So the next question I was going to ask you, um, what do you eat for breakfast? I, I don't eat breakfast. I don't normally eat till noon. So I, I get up quite early. Um, and yeah, I, don't, I, 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 like, I wait till lunchtime. So I remember listening to one of your other podcasts and, and, the, and the lady was saying that about oh, the, blo- the, the, the one who runs the blog network and she was saying she, she eats around 10 but I but she gets up later but I get up like super early like I actually wake up at 4 a.m so um, we're, we're twins I do that so do by that. the time lunch comes around like it, you know I've been up for eight hours but I tend to I tend that tends to be the time when I'll eat for the first time in a day or do you do like intermittent fasting yeah, well, it was it's it's based on that, and it's just become normal for me. I was never a big breakfast eater anyway. I was not. I'm not one of them who can wake up and eat first and foremost. But now, like, well, about four years ago, I started the intermittent fasting, the twelve to eight, and um, it works for me. Like now, I actually don't have hunger. Before normally about eleven o'clock, I can kick in, but because I I tend to like I've got an eight year old son, so once I do a bit of work in the morning, again I'm ready for school, take him to school. And then I come back, so it's normally about nine fifteen when I hit the, the 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 desk, and then I'll have a lot of meetings. I do a lot of meetings in the morning, so by the time I look up, it's normally eleven eleven thirty, and then I just hold on and have a have a half an hour break at lunchtime. So I tend to just eat eat then. Okay. Wow. Okay. I need to get on that intermittent fasting. Okay. Cool. Okay. Twins live in Liverpool. This and that. Okay. I get I, I get you. Great minds think think alike. The other question I was going to ask you, what does an artist mean in 2021? What is your definition of an artist in 2021? That's, it, that's, it. that's interesting because I think, I think the artist, the definition of artists won't change. I think they are creators, creatives. They hear and see things and feel things that a lot of us other people on this earth don't and they find a way to articulate that in a way that 90 percent of the population can't and i think yeah i i look at artists in a very like special way because i, I again it's like sounds mad but you know there's people who can see spirits or feel spirits or feel the change of times and the winds that like you know i think our artists are plugged in that way like they can feel love in a way that we might be able to talk about it and go, oh, you know, I felt so like, 
you know, it felt made me feel good. We might that might be the fairest we get, but artists find a way to put that into like song, into rhyme, and make us feel it. Like you know, I was listening to Lauren a bit of Lauren Hill, Lauren Hill's album Miss Education. I was like, she, she makes you feel frustration. She makes you feel love. She makes you feel vulnerability. Sometimes in the same song, and I was like, that's 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 the quint- quintessential artist to me. Like they make mm. you. F- they feel something and they can make you feel that even in even from a recording, even 20 years later. Like that's that's an artist to me. Um poetically said, poetically said. I can't say I can't say anything on that. Okay, so we can see that we've got a true, true creative here. So um talking about music, how did you get into it? Because I'm sure there's a journey before you made and got involved into the playmaker group and doing all your creative um, consulting and producing. How did you get into music? You talked about basketball, but how did you get into music? Yeah, well, all the time I was, I was really, like my teenagers, I was into basketball. Like that was the thing that really lit my fire, but I was always listening to music and, you know, I just consume music. So as, as a young person, and, and, and you'll probably relate to this as well, like, Black family, especially when you're outside of, I'd say London, like those those gatherings become quite important of the, you know, the norms and the passing of information and the passing of culture and us. So I grew up all these parties in our house. And again, I said, you know, my mum's Jamaican, so you've got that side. And then my dad's uh, dad's family is Ghanaian, so we'd have that side. But, you know, I was born, I'm, I'm in Liverpool. So it was all this music all around, you know, I'd be... You know, I had an older cousin who, who, strange enough, I was with today called Reg, and he gave me, he put me onto hip hop, US hip hop, from when I was like six, seven. The first record I remember is LL Cool J, I Need Love. And then, you know, he got me big into that and American culture because he, he had an Imro through his family. But then, family, like I was listening to like Daddy Lumber and High Life and stuff from my dad's side, and then reggae. Uh, Scar, etc., from my mum's side, and then Black American Soul, because that was always in the house. So I was consuming all this music. Um, and then with my friends, they were into things like Bros and Two Unlimited and stuff like that. So I was picking up all these mixed, mixed stuff. And then as I got older, I really got into hip hop during my teens, and I was consuming a lot of music. There's a DJ called Mark Tondrai on Radio One before Tim Westwood time, and I was recording this tape, they recording these radio shows and listen back. Um, I had um, a cousin in London who, was, who, who would get CDs from the market. So I, I, was, I was literally like madly consuming music, buying maybe three or four albums, cassettes and CDs later on, a week, uh, a month. So, you know, by the time I was 18, I had like four or 500 CDs and tapes and like really avid collector, but I didn't understand that someone like me who didn't, didn't couldn't play musical instruments, couldn't write lyrics, I didn't see a place for me in the industry. So I would consume as a fan. Uh, I went to university and studied law. So that was kind of, I was looking at that being my path. And it's only when I was in my last year of university, I stopped playing basketball because I got uh, injured, tendonitis in both knees. So my America dream ended. And my cousin who was from East London at the time, he said, well, his mum said, He's moving to Liverpool to go to university. Um, he's been writing some songs and, and people in the studio say, like, you should do a couple of shows. So they've got him a couple of shows. You're organised. Will you manage him? And I was basically like, well, I'm moving back to Liverpool um, after being away for a year. Why not? And one thing led to another. And we ended up starting a company called Airbeats, which was our first business, really. And it was essentially to manage him and his interests, but, but kind of within a couple of years really grew to be quite widespread. So, you know, to, to sum it up, I just fell into music as a career. Um, but I've always had a love, and I suppose, I wouldn't say a thick, I'm probably understanding of music as a, a social force, but also as a reflector of society. And I've, I've, yeah, and so with that respect, and with kind of, for like with my path through my cousin really falling into it it's it's it, it shocked me a little bit but as I said sorry about that 
it just yeah. died for a second so I feel my internet's paying up but we're still recording so where yeah. I, I heard until that one one second is that you with your cousin from East London Airbeat you started and it grew and then it just oh psh- yeah so yeah so it, it basically you know we started this company I was kind of looking after his interest the first couple of shows we've done you know printed t-shirts done some cds sold them and things led to another you know artists who were in the crowd were like oh we want to get with you because we were doing urban music we were doing rap music in Liverpool and it was original music so it was this thing where we almost even though it was getting played in clubs there was no one really making original music so people gravitated to us and then once they gravitated we started building this fan base and again it just it just ballooned so within like to, from two that was 2004 I'd say by 2008 I was doing it full time um but I set the business up quite quite quickly and yeah it, it I just fell into it like that's all I can say like 16 years later I honestly 17 years now I suppose I just fell into it and it, it just it, it just felt like it's just rolled quite naturally to where I am right now Wow, that sounds like a dream. You could be creative and make a full-time living and just roll into it. Come on now, give us a secret sauce. How did you become successful in just like being, you know, navigating in this like streaming era in, in music? Yeah. Well, I, or, or, like I, I, key things. Like I did, I did, it did, when I say it rolled naturally, I'm saying like I put in work, you know, I've I done my business plan. I test traded. I started the business properly. I went from a sole trader to a limited company you know, uh, limited by guns. I've, I've done all that stuff. Like I'll never discount that I've put in work and I've read, you know, even in the room where I am now, I've got probably about a hundred books. I'm always reading, trying to show up on the thing. So it's not, it's, I'm not, but like what I'm saying is it's, I never planned this and I never planned to be where I am right now. When I started, I thought the only way you could be in the music industry is by being like Dame Dash and Rockefeller or P Diddy. Like you had to be the, industry tycoon and sell millions of records what i've un- what i've understood by being open and learning and listening is going now nah, there's places for us all here not everyone earns a million pounds not everybody needs to be front and center you know I'm, and that's where i can say like i am i'm a creative consultant who does project events and program and initiative design i, I i'm a de- i'm a designer i'm a creative practitioner in this space but I didn't know that was a thing before so I, I like I've because I've just been open and listened and tried I've come to a point of understanding the nuance and the different opportunities and different paths but just by doing so I feel like I've done my homework to enable myself to be able to see what's going on and see the opportunity but I've I've not I've not followed the path that is um, preordained or pre-written. So that that that's that that's what I was trying to get to. Like I've I've just tried stuff like the stuff that I do, you know, design and programs for or initiatives and stuff like that is because I've done that as part of the business. And then about three or four years later, when someone comes to you and goes, Will you design this and we'll pay you to this to do this? Then I'll start to get on. I might be good at that. Oh, I am good at that. And then I'm just doing it at higher, higher levels. Same way with the documentaries. We, we, ha- we couldn't get music on radio, so we produced our own radio show. So I learned to edit a little bit and editorial, like I've learned that. And I listen to radio. So I've learned these things just by doing to the point where then I have a suite of skills that I, I've, I've got that then become opportunities to earn. And then, you know, as you get more... Um, as you get better and better and connect the dots, you become a little bit more strategic about how you utilize them. So you get to the point where maybe now I'm, I can be on boards and I may have the ear of the mayor of Liverpool or the leader of, you know, the head of YouTube music or whatever. And it's, it's just the same thing, just in different playgrounds, so to speak, but it's all rolled to, to me, it's rolled naturally. So, okay, cool. So what I'm trying to break down, because it just sounds like, to me, if I'm going to be honest, it sounds like a dream. You just, you just did a bit of this. I'm, I'm being very facetious. Did a bit of this, did that, yeah. and you just did. But it's hard work. And it just seems like you have that belief in yourself of trying something, producing something good, building a portfolio, and you leverage that at every opportunity. Is that what you kind of did, right? If I'm just trying to sum that yeah, up. Yeah, I, I, I feel so. I think the leverage thing means, like, that sounds 
like I think I'm the I'm I'm the opposite of that because I don't feel like I rightly or wrongly I don't think I leverage stuff I think what it is is I go I have I have a view on that thing and I believe if I honestly believe I can bring something to the table and I will gladly go I've done stuff like this before but the, the idea of leverage sounds to me like I utilize it in a way and it, it probably is that way but I'm I, maybe I'm a bit of a purist I like to just believe that I, I look at things and say, can I add value? Can I improve what you're doing respectively? Respective, you know, with total respect to them and what they are doing. And, and that's how I get involved. So for instance, like the Levi's Music Project, they, they'd done like three or four projects before they decided to come to Liverpool. And um, they called me in through recommendation. And I went to speak to them and I, 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 they told me a little bit about what they were planning. And I said, okay, well, this is my perspective based on what I've done, based on how I think the, the user of the service, which is the artist, what they will want from it and what they would expect from it. This is what I think about the partners you've got and you, how you better like, better utilize them. And then it, that turns around with them going, we want you to design it, design what we're doing in Liverpool. Strap our design, you design it. And then it comes from that to go, can you bring in the personnel to deliver it? Because the way you're talking about it, we feel like you just got this unique perspective. So my thing is, and it was a conversation because they've been told to speak to me. It was never about me leveraging my past or my experience. It was more about that hopefully this can help you. And then it naturally unfolded that they've gone back and gone, actually, you know what? We need you to do it for us. And that's the way it's, you know, Liverpool International Music Festival, the festival had a, a, a program and curate for the city council. It was the same way they said, do you want to tell us, do you want to do a presentation for 10 minutes of what a music festival in the city would look like? And I'd done it. And then they went, well, can you do it for us then? Ah, you know I love I mean? it. So it. No, but, never, you know yeah, I mean? but it's your reputation. You're not going to give anything to anybody. So you've built that reputation. You've built that credibility. You've got that portfolio to get to that level, even if recommendations or not. For you. So what I, if I'm giving personal stuff, I, I struggle with, like, I want to do all these things, but I'm like, I need to show the value. I need to show the work you know if you build something people will come you know what I mean or I need to build a ladder so I, I'm just hearing getting inspired like reinforcing that idea just produce good work and it will come you know just produce good work and yeah I've, I've, and I've, that, yeah I 100% I agree I think the, the the proofs in the pudding so like when I said about Liverpool International Music Festival and pitching to the council and bear in mind I was pitching to the, I was doing a presentation for the people who just done 08 five years earlier. So they're not, they're not big, but my point so of just view people was, don't know, just, 08, Liverpool had some regeneration European funding and they're like, yeah, this capital culture thing so, in 20, 2008. 2008. Yeah. And, and I was, was in Liverpool money, was like, at that time. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was big money. So like, it was European, it was the European capital culture. So they have a lot of, UK capital city as a culture, but this was like the European one. So it's a big, you know, massive investment into the city. So the team that worked on that and delivered that with the team that I was speaking to for Liverpool International Music Festival, and it was the city's leading festival. They just got rid of a festival that used to bring 300,000 people to the city every, every August bank holiday. And they were saying, we want to change it. So yeah, I went in with that. But my point being was to, and Cassandra, it was like reference to what you were saying. I had done, I've done events before and I've done small festivals. Like I've done the Anthony Walker Found Foundation Festival, which was a festival uh, in memory of Anthony Walker, who was the young yeah, man. Yeah, do you want to talk about there. that? Because I knew his, her, his, um, his sister, we went uni, not which uni one? together, but we was at the same, Dom Dominique. Dominique. Yeah, no, she's a- Yeah, I know Dominique yeah. well. I know okay, Dominique cool. well. Dominique, so like- Just say yeah, hi, I, do, you, do you remember this girl called Cassandra? Um, she probably I'm going to say that to her. I'm going to yeah. say, I'd I, I speak to Dominique. Me and Dominique are quite close, me and the family, I believe. Like Angela as well, the younger sister, the younger sister, we were close. Um, so yeah, so Anthony Walker was a young man who lived in Heighton. Um, another guy, he, he was, he was, he was going to do law. He was, he played basketball. I actually coached him when he was a little bit younger. Um, and he was murdered with an ax in the head. Um, two young people who actually went to school and were in the same class as his sister, um, killed him, which was classed as a racist attack. Um, and it, it devastated like and there's loads of complexities to it because it was you know a black family not living in a black area and 
what does that mean? And there's all these things that was unpicked from it, but you know, it was a tragedy. And I, I 2005. I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I and think I that's, managing, coming, that's when the year when I came to Liverpool, it was just like, why yeah, are, you, yeah. are, you, are you still yeah, going, are you going to like, Liverpool? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I have yeah, to go. So that's what I'm saying. You can, you, you can imagine the ripple effect. And I'm, but my the artist I work with, we started my company with my cousin, Cove, he'd done a song um, called Where Did We Go Wrong, which was classed as an Anthony Walker tribute song, which it wasn't at first, but it made reference. But it went out and basically the family reached out to us. And then from that point, we had a relationship with the family. And um, so they started this festival. This, it was in October after he, he was murdered. And we programmed bits every year. And so, so by the time, my point being, by the time I got to the council and I was doing a 10 minute presentation of what a music festival should look, for, for the, look like for the city, I'd done these things, albeit on a smaller level. So I, had, I did have a resume, but I'd never done something where you have 300,000 people come like over oh, a three days period. Hold on, let's just stop here. Ha okay, because what I'm trying to get is because sometimes I feel like it's just a mindset change about what you're doing. Because you might think, look, I've just done these, I would say inverted commas, if people can't see this and hear on audio, small events. And then you did this big, amazing thing, right? So, how does like black creatives have that mindset to like, okay, just to start with small festivals or small projects and get to the big ones. How did you, how did you try and transition? What was your mindset to, uh, to get there? Uh, 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 yeah, I don't think there was an actual transition. The, the way I was, I was on the, come on, come on, the day before I had to express interest in doing a presentation, I was coming back from London. I've been, I've been at radio with Cove and I said, I've got some ideas. I said, but they need to know basically tonight really. And he was like, just do it. because. You know, basically he said, what are your ideas? I told him, he said, just do it. It's 10 minutes, throw it against the wall. You, you believe, you, you actually believe in what you're saying. So that's easy for me. Like if I believe in something, I don't fear it. I don't fear being out my depth. Like I'm doing a project now for a massive organization. And like, it's, it's a big project. And they basically stepped aside. They brought me in to just speak. And now they've stepped aside and said, well, you're our, basically you're our commission editor for this you lead on that you sign off on the street. like but it's a big 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 million multi-million pound project and stuff but my thing is i know the stories i know the story so what i don't know about maybe the role or the title or whatever those things are that's a minor because the belief is coming from i know i can i can do and i know i can learn like one thing i'm very confident is i can learn and adapt but i know the actual thing that we should we're, we're being judged on so i frame it and go like so with the music festival to jump to that it's like i know how to book acts i know what good music is i respect every genre of music why not me like well, it could no. be the people there's people who've done it before for you and it's been the same right let me come and bring it for and if you know what if i last one year fine if i if if if, if i last longer and you like it even better but let's just have a go at it why not and that, that was my perspective. And that first year, the music festival, I brought Damien Marley to Liverpool. I had uh, the Lightning Seeds to perform with an orchestra to, to people in part. I had Soul to Soul. I had Dev from Radio 1. I had Little Mix, JLS. Hold on, Van. hold on, hold on. Like, hold on. It, you know what I mean? And, it, and, it, and to me, it set this whole thing about the city and the re 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 messaging of liverpool as a music city to go yeah. look this is contemporary this is diverse and that's because they just give me the ball and i just trusted my instincts and where i didn't know what i was doing i partnered with people who did and 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 to me it's it's it's, it's quite it's quite simple because it just it comes from honesty of what what do i do well what do i know what don't i know who should i work with and let's just get to work that sounds so so remarkable um yeah uh, just just do it and just produce good work and have faith in yourself and just you know and 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 sell yourself what have you got to lose so if I'm trying to be practical getting back how did you, okay so just by your work people recommended you so on you added value you could pitch you sell yourself well if someone's just starting out like look I want to do my own festival I don't know Damien Marley don't know a little bit like how how do they how do they start how would you someone start doing doing events I'll, yeah i think we 
I think you just got to do an event. Like, I, like it's mad. It's like, I remember Sway, the UK artist, Sway, and I remember he, uh. we were speaking one time and I think we were asking, we were looking to, for Decipher to help us out with some stuff. And at the time, Sway was popping and he had his crew and it, they were just doing amazing things. And he said, it's all really simple, you know, it's all really simple. It's like people just don't apply common sense. If you want your music in a shop, just go to the shop and ask them to put your music in the shop. And if you need to do something to kind of incentive, you know, I'd, I'd give them an incentive, just show them why they should do your thing. And if that's, you know, it's, it's, so I think if you, if you want to be in, in the music industry or you want to be a music professional or whatever, I see them as like verbs, like it's doing. So you just put on an event. If you're a promoter, you put, you promote events, you promote artists. So just do it. I think a lot of people are waiting for like, lightning to strike or i'll go to a big company and when i've got a budget i'll be good at your thing now just do it and learn like i've lost a lot of money promoting shows um i've done shows with hardly any people coming i've done shows that have been successful i've worked out where i i am in that space and what i took from that was i'm very good at programming i'm not the best marketeer i'm not the best promoter but yeah, you know, I can program something that the right promotional partner or the right marketeer will have a field day with. So I'm a, I am I can design program. So that's what I took out. But I had to, to get to that point, I had to put on shows. I had to just put on my first show. And I put on my first show because no one else would put on a show for us. So to, in order to sell the CDs and showcase the artists back in 2004, I had to put on our own shows. And I had to learn how to get people there. And then I had to learn how to pre-sale pre -sale it and then sell extra stuff so we made a bit more income on the day. So then when I do a music festival with 45,000 people a day, it's the same, it's actually the same thing. And I know what other everyone else should be doing because I've been there. Like I know if people are excited about it, I know if people aren't, but fundamentally the most important thing I'm meant to know is, is are the selection of artists correct? Do they resonate with people and does it fit a wider narrative that can be that can be communicated. So, but it all comes from me doing that first show and that second show and that third show and that fourth show and that fifth show. Do you know what I mean? And one thing I'll say for me, because of where I grew up, and I say this is a benefit, is like, I've grew up in an area where like, I'm, I'm less than 1% of the population. I went to a school where it was like five black people and two of them were in my family and the other three would be classed as family. Like two, two, so like two of us, we are blood, blood family. The other three are from the same tribe as my dad. So like, and there's 1,500 kids there. Like I know how to speak to white people and I know how to speak to white people in authority. And I know how to speak to black people because my family and I used to play in the South End. I used to play in toxic basketball. So I used to be around a lot of black men, men particularly, but women, young people, families. So to me, I'm, I'll go anywhere. I can never get anywhere. So I don't have imposter syndrome and stuff like that. Like I don't have a feeling of, if anything, I have the option. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I am an outsider, but because I'm, I'm an outsider, I don't really care. Because when I go in, I just got to do whatever my job is or what I'm there to do, and I know that will lead to the acceptance. So, I am. Um, I, I feel like the idea of going to a council or going to a large organization. If I believe what I'm doing and I'm saying to them, it, at what whatever perception they might have or any insecurity I have that I can't goes away do you know what I mean it's like and I remember reading Dame Dash who obviously worked with Jay-Z and he's, he's 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 well known for his acumen I think I remember reading something where he just basically said they put their pants on one leg at a time like us so why the hell would I ever be in a room thinking that I can't do like I've I've, I've come from very little and achieved this is Dame Dash so why would I ever feel like they can't. And that's why someone like Jay-Z is such a big inspiration to me because I'm looking and go, look at this man navigate. He's came from nothing. He's came from the actual bottom and his, his brain's taking him everywhere. Not And it's not strength. It's not anything physical. It's just his thought process and his approach. So I've always had that thing where like, if I can apply that some of that thing to this world and my skill set and my, and, and always be improving, I don't think there's a room that I can't be in. And I, but I also believe that I'll only be put in rooms where I've got something to deliver anyway. So I just feel like quite quite secure and quite confident in, in what I'm doing. This is a bit 
I've just wrote something down, but this is what you were saying. So talking about programming or curating that could be used interchangeably and some academics say a creator is a certain thing or a programmer or a cultural producer those words are used in interchangeably but I've, but I think the, the listeners and the viewers will know what you do right how did you develop your taste because people take paying for taste and that seems to be your expertise how did you develop that um taste is an interesting one because People, when people have referred to me as a curator, like when, again, when I got the Liverpool International Music Festival role, they said, you are the curator. And I didn't know what a curator was. Um, I had to learn what it was. But when I realized what it, what it was, was sorting through noise and selecting what makes sense for the statement you're trying to make. And that's how I view it. So curation is just cutting through the no noise, but I'd, I'd always, technically you always do that. So when your friend goes, I'm not really into rap music and you shouldn't listen to the fact you can go, do you know who you like? You're like Tupac and you're like, probably rap him if you like Tupac and you're like, to me, that's curation. It's just like, or we're doing a show and we want to show the best new artists in the indie rock scene. Okay, cool. These are the five. That's curation because you, you select them from a larger pot. Uh, taste is, is, is a weird thing because I, I feel like that's quite subjective. Um, and I don't know if people would go, Yao's got great taste in music, I, 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 but I do think people can easily say Yao is very good at curating. Do you get what I'm saying? Because I don't know if people know my, would know my personal taste in anything. More so Are they see sure? my because... professional curation of events. Because I program, like, mm. you know, I've just done a Black Music Festival, but I also have programmed I program a multi-genre festival, the City of Liverpool. So people might presume that something is my taste on that lineup, but then like I've, I've had, okay, last the last festival we had Sigma with a live live orchestra, and we had Nile Rogers, full band, and then we had um, Sister. Who else did we have? Sorry, Sister Sledge with a live orchestra. So from that, you could presume you know what is my favorite thing of all them things. But you, you might be totally wrong and it might not be any of them. But my point was being, I curated that to what I believe the city wanted and what the city would enjoy and what would be easy to get people excited for outside the city to come. Because that's my remit. Do you know what I mean? So curation to me is a lot of time. This is the spec of what you've got to do artistically and editorially. Get as close to that as possible. Whether I think of that or someone else thinks of that, that's how I see that. Whereas taste is a bit odd because taste is like the nuance. It's like, but a lot of times I think in my work, you wouldn't necessarily know my taste specifically, but you'll know, you'll know the work. If you go what I'm saying, I know that sounds really odd. I don't like the work I do is not never really about me. So I don't think it's about my taste ever. Okay. If anything, you might say it's my approach. You can judge my approach, but I don't know if you you could really say it's my taste. Interesting. We we, we got into a bit of a philosophy of cur curation <laughs> versus tastemaker, um, trend setting, and all those kind of things. No, I, but, I, you I, know, I, but you know what? And and let me just qualify. It. Like, if I was like Banksy, and Banksy was curating an exhibition, then I'll get that Banksy's taste because it's about him. What I'm saying is. Because I'm a creative consultant, it's never about my taste. It's about my approach to a creative solution for the client. So it's just slightly different. So whether they call me a curator or a programmer or whatever, it's actually not about my taste. Because no one's asking about me. They're not asking me as a person, as an entity, as a figure to do it. If they're just asking for me to, to execute something that fits in with an agreed specification, so to speak. I know that sounds very scientific, but I see no, that. No, 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 but I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that, but I don't want to like debate your whole, your whole, your whole life and e existence, but I just feel like if I'm being honest or authentic, like you must have a bit of it, you know, every artist or every creative person, no matter how objective you might be, the must, if we did a thematic analysis of what you've done, so most of us are, oh yeah, you, you, you've done that there. 
this is this is what Yao's Yao's Yao, Yao's Yao's doing. There needs to be a gold a golden thread because you're bringing something yeah, the gold- of, your, of your life experiences and your and your and your experience into it. It might be subtle. I don't know. Thread. I don't know. No, nah, no. Nah, the golden thread. The golden thread is not artistic. It's 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 positioning, and the the golden thread is anything that seems like it can't work or there's a challenge in it and it deals and it's around music or underrepresented groups within music that's the golden thread so can liverpool have a festival that is community minded but is commercially viable and can liverpool change itself from being like a festival that looks back to a festival that looks at what's happening now and the future that's that's the that's the theme that connects with power up uh, uh, initiative that is supporting and tackling anti-black racism in the UK, but supporting black music creators and industry professionals across the UK. That's what ties it. Under representation, um, potentially counting out, there's a challenge with how we reframe things and how we change the status quo. That's the golden thread. The golden thread is not my taste or my, it's, 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 it's these things. And then what it is, is just, okay, if Yao is involved, Sounds really horrible to say that in third person, but if Yao, if we bring in Yao in, I'm saying it as if I'm the client, he may give us a different approach to this where we may supersede our expectations or we may approach it in a very different way to get the same results. So yeah, the thread so to me is- So it's about your guiding principles, it's about your ethos, and, and I'm hearing it's about you representing the underdog. Or, or, it's about that community engagement, which sometimes brands, this is my personal opinion, what brands and people don't really get. Um, or sometimes in these artists or organizations or where they represent people, artists or, you know, or, or government or whatever organization, they might not even speak to a black person, black person not even on their board. So they don't even have that kind of things, like those subtle things to think about. And it's weird yeah, you yeah. say that because you took me into a space. I'm not going to say anything for anyone online, but I was, I went to do this, cr- applied to do this creative job in Liverpool recently um this thing and I'm just like you say you're community minded and look but how have you reached the community and how have you reached these type of groups and I'm like I'm in a way in this interview was giving like free consultant advice and I was like you you know about how you could connect certain um people so it's, it's, it's yeah, interesting yeah. because your voice and your insight is so valuable because you they these organizations can connect with more audiences in a meaningful and that, authentic yeah, well, that, that's way. It. That's it. That's the key. And that's the, they they that's miss the that key. sometimes. They miss the authentic way. They're just like, oh, we're just going to bring a random influencer and it's going to just work like that. And like, no, 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 no. You can't just capitalize on one black person to that's be the gatekeeper the the of that's everything. The yeah, that's the key. And that's the nuance. So, you know, with, with, the music festival, for instance, the the group that was underrepresented was the contemporary music creator in Liverpool and the sector with Power Up. It's the black music creator and the uh, industry professional. Um, with um, Levi's Music Project, it was the emerging artists, both within Liverpool and then later the work I've done with them across the country. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's finding them and going, what, what do you need and what do you want? because this brand or this entity wants to better represent you. Okay, and that's my role. How do I reflect those things? But also the skill I've learned is to reflect it, but reflect it in a way that the client actually understands so they can actually internalize it, so they champion it. So, you know, my role is is quite transient and stuff. It's like, I'm never gonna be around forever. So my job is to make sure it actually can exist without me. That's the measure of a consultant, I believe. It's like, mm-hmm. it's not about the length of time you stick around. In, in fact, you want to do such a good job that you don't have to be around for more than three years, really. You want it to kind of be able to evolve and move, or you want to be able to work on it, but in a different aspect and start slowly move away from, from what, you, what you were doing in the beginning. So, yeah, so I suppose maybe a, 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 a philosophical way to approach it, but to sum up is like, there's artists... And there's creative thinkers and doers. I'd probably put myself more in the creative thinkers and doers because it's not about my, 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 um, my, I wouldn't say it's not about my vision, but 
it, it's, it's about me bringing out a client's vision, adding it to my approach and internalizing me as an artist, I believe it, it's, it's fundamentally about their vision and everyone else just ex- helping them execute their vision. So that's why I'll never put myself in the artistics. I've never used that phrase around myself. Okay. All right. I'm with kids. Creative consultant, <laughs> creative, creative, creative producer. Okay, so we're coming up to um, the end because I think you just give so much knowledge for people, for emerging artists just to start out, to try the mindset, building a portfolio, um, the self-belief. Um, you know, you did come from academic, you did law, law you came from, you know, bas- basketball didn't work out and you just adapted um, to the needs and sort out the needs in, in this market and see where you could put your value and that's where you are today of being very very successful and building all these meaningful partnerships because some people like in these days with Instagram oh anyone can have a brand partnership and it's you know what is of value can you can you give and you know you can mutually get out of it um, just to give more value for people who listen to this I, I would say that you're quite multidisciplinary, if I can say the word multidisciplinary. Oh my God, this is what I call myself every day. Multi, can, can you just multi help discipline. me out? Yeah. Multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary. I say this every is day. Right? You know, because, yeah, yeah, know. because yeah. because this is what I'm supposed to call myself. I call myself that as a multidisciplinary creative artist. So because you do different things, you do things for radio, you do things for, well, music, you do, you know, I, I struggle sometimes. Oh, how do you, how do you don't get lost in the noise? Because some people try to put you into a box. No, you know, you just you just do urban and make it up. You just do urban music. You just you just do that, and that's it. How do you? How could you? How do you pitch yourself and navigate and still keep what you're doing and do multiple different projects? Yeah, I think I'm getting better. I think the last year has been a, a great time for me because I've I've worked out that I can do quite a lot of things but there's certain things and in certain spaces I do things better. So number one, I haven't, I haven't really pitched for stuff. So I don't have a, I don't have a problem. Like a lot of the work I've done a lot is, is referral. So I, I get people know why they are referring me or companies know why mm. they refer or suggest to me. Um, in terms of how don't I get lost in it is like, cause I plan. And because I review quite a lot, I, I kind of see if I'm going far off. And like I'm, I'm quite in tune with myself. I know that like if I'm if I'm stuck in a position where I'm doing loads of admin or loads of firefighting or managing staff when I don't want to manage, I'm like quite like I can feel it that it's wrong. So I tend to transition a lot. So where I am now is I know what I do well. So me, if you spoke to me three years ago, I wouldn't be able to articulate that. I'll be going, I do content and I'd manage and I manage artists and I do the, I, it'll sound like a lot worse. Now I know what I do. Like if I work with an artist, I do it in a design perspective. Okay. I'm a really good artist and I've got this project I want to put out. Okay, cool. I'll design your campaign and, and, and help you see who you should bring in and how you're going to communicate. What are the key values and key things that, that so I know what how I work. So I won't never I will never call myself a manager of talent again. Do you know what I mean? So I know, okay, this week alone I've had three. Yeah, already by Thursday, I've had three different artists that have asked me to man represent them. And I've said no to all because that's not what I do. So I'm I'm starting to get better at saying no. Um, I'm starting getting better at connecting the dots. So when I do something like I love doing content. But I think the way I'll do content now is if I'm doing a festival, I will commission documentaries and ex- executive produce documentaries as part of that festival or part of that event. And it will either totally fit in, but I will not be, I'm a docu, you know, I make documentaries or I'm a producer of documentaries because that's not what I do. So even the stuff I've done last year, the Marcus Garvey documentary on, for Radio 4, or I just done one on Dan Meese, who's a sport architect for World Service. I executively produce them from a standpoint of telling the story, but I'll probably going forward, I'll probably never do anything like that standalone. It will be part of a, a wider narrative, which will probably be one of the causes or projects or events or initiatives that I'm part of. So it's 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 me being able to that. I've almost got to curate my my work output, and if I do that, I don't think I'll become overwhelmed. And I don't think I'll be doing too much stuff that is not 
in the direction that I should or want to be going in. Perfect. No, I, I think I'm I'm taking and writing notes. I'm like, I should do that. I know, know who you are. Don't say yes to everything. Because I'm like, yeah, I'll take it. It's hard. It, I'll it's take hard the money. You know, you do, mm. well, that's it. If you're, do, if you're doing your own thing and you've, you need to make it work and people are offering things, it's very hard to say no. But what I've actually realised is, and this is how I can, I like, my, like the same things that I've gone, this is what I do and this is what I don't do. And I'd argue that my income just on having that approach and saying no to certain things or reframing certain things when people offer is, I think my income's gone up fourfold. So okay. I don't have to do 20 things anymore that are little bits, 20, you know, or 10 things that are 500 pounds and some of them are things I don't want to do. Now I can do four or five things that are two and a half grand in a month that will then, and it's what I want to do. And evidently, it becomes because if I do those four or five things and I do them really well, then more people see them because they're better projects, which means then more people come to me for that piece of work and that style of work. So then I just keep moving up. And that's 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 the goal right now. My next two or three years, that's my goal is to kind of go. I've been doing these things at this point, but because I've been doing some of that, some people are a bit unclear. I need to define it more and keep moving up, keep moving up to the point where maybe I've only got two clients, but they the value I'm giving them and the value of that end, that thing for that organization is so high and for the end user that that becomes my calling card so then i can go, i can reach higher and higher and that's that's the uh, that's that's the plan over the next two or three years amazing okay so we're gonna uh the last thing what i say um ask people on this podcast is like tell us the best review or the best testimonial but i think you said it like people just come to you because they know the value of what you do, but if you can sum it up in like a couple of sentences, what was the best thing yeah, your I, client I, I, I said to you? Yeah, I, I think it's hard because I'm gonna get into all this testimonial thing because I should do it, but I have I have I've never done it. But I think the the best thing that people used to say about me, and I, I assume they still do, but I think the one thing I always remember is like I get stuff done. So I remember like from I used to work with Wiley, I used to run his label for a little while, and some of the stuff I've done on different projects is like if you work with Yao, he will get things done. And a lot of the reference people say, like, get in touch with Yao because if you want to win, he's going to help you. Hence the Playmaker thing, like, my Instagram handle's Playmaker13. It's not phonetically, but the reason what, like, it's like, I feel like that's what I do. I, I help make plays for organisations and individuals. When I used to play basketball, when I was 13, hence the thing. But, like, and the company, the Playmaker group, it's like being able to set others up in positions to score and to achieve and I feel like that's the that's the reputation um, that I've got, and I and I like that because it's it's I wouldn't say it's one I've cultivated purposely. It's definitely not what it's one that I think has happened because people have worked with me and I've, I've I've delivered, and then that's why they keep coming back. And what I really what I really focused on a lot of people focus on like always looking to the side. I've never been a kid who seen what someone else had and wanted it my thing's always been on retention so if I've got a client I want to be able to build with them over a long period of time and grow with them and grow my role within what they're doing so what I do like is a lot of my clients I retain so they keep coming back naturally to 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 have me involved or I, I and I still have good relationships like I don't think I've ever had a bad relationship with a client and um, it's never ended but so like I feel like that is that's what people would would say about me. I get stuff done, and I bring an interesting approach. But you know, more so that they want to continue working with me. That's just so ins- no, it's just so inspiring, and I I feel like everything happens for a reason. <laughs> I feel like even though this podcast is for everybody, in my head of the so much stuff's going on in my life right now, I'm thinking, oh God, create your life create you know and just you know stick to yeah. I, don't, I don't say stick to your brand it sounds a bit oh, but you know stick you know make it clear for people about why you're adding value and why they should want you so there's no so there's no confusion so I think you just sold something in my head about what I should be doing I've, I've got to do a pitch tonight about about something so I've, you just helped me a lot with that so thank you so much yeah. even like the thing you know I, the thing you were doing with this podcast I've, I've looked at it and got it sounds mad this but like R and D that you're doing into approach, like I know, I know that's probably like a soft outcome of it, but I'm like, do you know what the value of that is to the world? 
Like for you, Listen, it's like yeah. you can go to anyone and go, this is what connects all these people. This is what can the brain, you know what I mean? And how they approach things. So Listen, yeah. I don't want to be horrible. I don't want to be, but I I find value doing this. And I know people do. But the thing is, in Instagram life, people are like, oh, you have X amount of followers. Only a couple hundred people will listen to you. Duh, 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 duh. But when this blows up, when? <laughs> yeah. It's value because... But, all, but, all, but also, Cassandra, and I'll say this now, when you read, like, you read about people who write books and they go, you know, I spoke to 100 people and now I'm an expert in building a, a company of one. They are experts because they spoke to 100 people. Napoleon Hill, who wrote the, wrote the book on finance or whatever, he spoke to even less people, but he spoke to like high earners and he wrote a book that now is considered Think and Grow Rich. And, 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 and now he's considered the best book on manifesting fa- financial enrichment in your life. Like he didn't, you're, you spoke to more people than he spoke to. But he's, so right now I'm looking and go, you are a thought leader in this space because you know what everyone's, and that, that's what I'm saying. That's the value. So if you were speaking to brands about how, or companies, how to, you know, develop the next entrepreneurs or the next black um, entrepreneurs or whatever, you can go, well, I know it because I've spoke to them. I've spoke to these people. I spoke to people in the States. I spoke to the people in the UK. I spoke to the, the leaders in so many different fields. I know what connects them. I'm not speaking to just sports people or musicians or whatever anyone else might. Like I'm speaking to like, my, my, people who've got great minds across the board and I know what connects them all and I, I know that when most of these were 16 between 16 and 18 they had the fork in the road and they done it like you know like and that's what I'm saying like I, I looked at this podcast thing and when I found out he's in the you know he's British and you know a female black female that has like like the gold you hold here is like is is it's, it's you know immense. what yeah you know what I'm I'm not trying to say that you know you know in private how much people have said this to me and I'm just like I just I had to rename the podcast so I could put black in it (laughs) just to get it more um search you know so people can see the content but no I really I appreciate that because a lot of people said that to me privately and I'm just trying to get more people to see this because you know what it is I've been a jeweler one of my main discipline of being being a fine fine jeweler and it's you know it's hard because I don't have a rich husband and I don't have family in the jewelry yeah. industry, and that's how people usually make their jewelry lines. And anyway, long long story short, right? How much money I've spent listening to people I shouldn't be listening to? Usually, people are not in the same positions at me. Haven't come from nothing, yeah. yeah how much time yeah. I spent money on business con consultants when I could have just gone on Google, or I knew it in my gut. I knew in my gut this was the wrong thing to do, but I didn't have people around me, look like me, who came from my background, who could say, well, Cassandra, you know what? Just like Jay-Z or just like you, just do this, this, and this. And I'm like, oh, I yeah, see yeah. that. I don't need to pay 10 for this X much for a business consultant where I can learn from my own people who's going through the yeah, same yeah. journey, who are just yeah. probably a few steps ahead of me or we're on the same journey. And I'm thinking, no, everyone's pretending like there's some big old you know know everything and they don't you know and that's i feel it. like in your gut and, and with and with your people you 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 know the way and that's you know the, what, pa- the, the pa- community pa- i'm trying to create well the power you've got is not only have you got the information that you've got through this and the connections mm-hmm. but like you know you could bring it to the you could it sounds mad but you know you could get sponsorship to put on events invite some of these podcast guests you've got connect them and network and be the person who actually that is your thing. You connect the dots. You are connecting people. So you might look at me and go, yeah, I was amazing. Actually, I think he could have value for that person I interviewed who does programming, but probably wants to kind of do the or the person who's developing a brand, but doesn't know how to communicate it. And, it, and you could connect these people and that could be your thing. And that could be the, your network could be what pays you. And, and then you can go to like black businesses and go, oh, you want to start working with black entrepreneurs or you are, okay, pay me 30 grand. I've got the network. I know if you want, you, you want to, you want someone to work on this exhibition who's worked in Mark, I've got the person, but my consultancy fee is X amount. Like, cause Mobo is doing that now, Mobilize, they're getting a database of black professionals. So brands can pay them and sponsor them to get access to black professionals. But you've done this already and authentically because you've spoken to these people and promoted these people and understand these people 
like that the powers in you and that's what i'm saying i as soon as i seen your thing and seen you and i looked at the people you interview and then what specialist specialisms they've done and that i was like yo that's 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 the gold that's the goal because i try to look because i think the people who i curate being a i think curator i'm trying to use creator or programmer i don't know um anyway it's debatable um how you use that to i try to get people who are doing things and they can add value and they give practical tips because you know what i hate i hate when i just did this i did this and then i was successful no did you get investment (laughs) who do you know how did you get from here to here and i'm i'm a a, a non-bs approach to that and yeah, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just very, very passionate, you know. You can just... write, like, how many, again, I'm not saying, how many, how many books are there on black entrepreneurship in the UK? Like, you could probably write a book on that and you could probably- and You know what, that was my- And that's, then go and do books and then go and get paid and then you'll get your press because you'll get, you'll get press from doing, you know, like the publisher will put you out there, there'll be story. I, I just think there's like, there's value in, and that's, you're right what you were saying. It's like, sometimes we're always looking around and sometimes we just need to look inside and then find people who boost us. So maybe what you need is a mentor who's done some of your stuff before that is very senior, who will just help nudge you every now and again. But the, but you've got what you need already. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, absolutely. No, thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate this is not sponsored by Liverpool Tourist Board or I've just, <laughs> I've just, I've, I've just met him. <laughs> today so you know it, you know and see how we just we're just vibing and um and also I feel like there's a kingship because I di- haven't lived I wasn't born in London so growing up in Coventry where I had my teenage years in Coventry now it's very multicultural back then in the 90s it wasn't um I was struggling to see things like you know just going to uni like even my my path my path going to uni I was like I had UCAS um, UCAS is like this u- university form before you to submit to which uni you want, which university you want to go to. I just put, I want to do creative arts. I want to do um, performing arts. And my head teacher said no. My mom said no. She's Jamaican. She's like, no. And yeah, then I yeah. end up doing this psychology degree, which I don't hey, know. Hey. I use. And I'm just like, and then I'm gone. And then it took me years to get around to the creative thing anyway. So I should have just started. This, that okay, anyway. okay. But this, but this is Cassandra, what I said. You were impressed by the fact that on law, knowing what you just said, do you think I was, I was, I was, I wanted to do law? Or do you think <laughs> I thought I had to do law? Now you said you had a guy named parent. So I'm just thinking, which one told that's you what to I'm do saying. I wanted to be, I wanted to do media. Cause that's what I loved. And that's what I was really good at. But when <laughs> I, when I, when, when I spoke to my careers advisor, they said, they ignored the sports thing. Well, they said, I heard you're going to be a sportsman. And then they went, but you're good at English. So why don't you do law? That's what they said. And I remember the guy, I think, his, well, I believe his name was Stuart. And I just went, okay, I'm going to do law. And then I remember saying, speaking to some people and they were like, oh, really? You're going to do law? And I went, I'm even more going to do law because you don't think I can do law. But like, I didn't really want to do law. What I wanted to do was probably media and anything around music culture. My last year at university, because I was ahead in my credits, I took um, another class um, to fill up my schedule, which was African-American um, studies through music so he was looking at like the 50s and the civil rights movement and that I was like mate you, I couldn't I, I read so many books at that time because that was my passion so it's the same thing with you like sometimes we're so we're so and this is the colonialism and diaspora stuff and that I think we're so like trying to figure out what the right thing is to do that we're not even giving ourselves the opportunity to do the thing that we know is right for us and because of that it takes us a long time to actually find ourselves and do so like I've said it. I, if I could have found out that this was me and it was still me at 16, 17, I wouldn't have gone, I wouldn't have gone to university and I would apply my trade and I would have probably been at this position at 23, 24. But because I'm I have to telling you, people, okay, just because I don't let the podcast the podcast go on, but listen, look at media now. Look at these people who are 15 starting their YouTube channel like um K, um KSI 14. Yeah, yeah. KSI yeah. and making millions in his early 20s. You know what I'm saying? Because he had the chance to develop his creative self while while he was at school. Exactly. Imagine how much creativity in in my teens. You know, if you think of like a singer in the music industry, I didn't really realize when I grew up, if you wanted to be like, I said, Beyonce, just a decent singer, a performing singer, you need to be starting 
seriously when you're in your in your teens yeah. not when you finish yeah. uni yeah. because yeah. you in pop world you're old by the time you yeah. know 21 22 yeah. that's when you come of age and you do the whatever you know so i'm just thinking to myself like raw if i was allowed to be creative when i was 16 onwards but, but this is cassandra this i could have made I... money then i could have been 10 10 years cassandra, ahead this is, this is why your podcast is important that's why you... You were important. That's why you should look to see how you can extend it and go and speak in schools to teens because they are still being educated the same way. And people that look like me and you are still probably being doctor, shunned. Doctor, education, lawyer, which which is fine. Yeah, so you, which is so fine. But they need people like you to go to in make there. Make money other ways. Well, I remember Jermaine Dupri. There's a magazine called Trace, and Jermaine Dupri said in it, he said it was a big poll quote, and it said, and I remember having this magazine when I was probably about 22, and it said. Always, always pay attention to the person you are at 10 years old because that's who you're meant to be. And it always resonated with me because I knew I was always into like, not business, but I was always doing like, the. I remember starting a magazine in, when, I was, when I was in year two, which was like the environment magazine. And I remember always starting little separations in the playground because I was like, those people are taking advantage of. I was that guy then. I love music. I look, I, yeah, I had a laugh. People knew me for, for, for smiling and having a laugh, but being quite intense with certain things. That's who I was then. And my point being is, if I was aware of what that meant and how could that, and so what we need is things like this and dialogue like this for us people to be able to em, embolden ourselves so we actually lean into that, as opposed to look at ourselves through the lenses of a, a society that doesn't understand us and that wants us to conform, but we're not meant to conform because we lead culture, we lead the conversation. We lead tech. We lead, We do all that stuff. We lead. We lead pop. I just don't know culture. what to do. Now. I just. I just feel really emotional. I feel. I <laughs> no, I. I legit feel like very emotional because I feel like a lot of black people. I would say bipoc, but I'm gonna say black people. Um, we go through this. We do all these degrees, and we get in debt. Look, look. A lot of us don't have generational wealth. You know, yep. we're not like at yep. the stage where. Sometimes our parents have houses, they can give, um, you know, oh, I've got inheritance, you know, or their parents are at uni are paying for their uni stuff, they're paying for their car. Some people in their thirties, their mom and dad's paying for their holidays and still for yeah, their yeah. mobile phone bill. Yeah, I only yeah. have the chance, when I was 16, I, ha I had to work, okay? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't have some of the privileges or, you know, work, I'm still working class or whatever, I don't have the privileges yeah. of my, you know, middle-class people at the time and stuff like that. So I'm starting not even in the race, I'm in the changing room. I'm, I, I yeah, haven't yeah. even got to the field yet. And then I'm going to get myself, like, get myself in debt at uni. And then even at uni, I have yeah. to work all the time. So I can't do all of the extracurricular activities like do Erasmus and do this and that. I didn't even know because I went to, not to cost, I went to John Moore's, yeah. I didn't know John Moore's yeah. used to be a polytechnic, but now it's a new university yeah. after 1992. Yeah. I didn't know you could do Erasmus, this, this extra credit, all this, because my mind was like, I need to pass, I need to work as a cleaner to pay for this and pay for that. Oh, well, when I went to, yeah. well, other universities enrich you, you could do this, network here, graduate course here. And I'm like, rah. I have a different experience to my white counterpart or my richer but that's, counterpart. That, but that's, that's, why I, that's why I said to you, like when you said, what advice would you give? And I said, I'll make my 16 year old self look, what, look, look, look around. Because that, all that stuff is for us, but we need people to be able to point to us and go, go and get yours. Like I tell my son now, he's eight. I say, you don't get given an education, you take an education. Like that's the, that's the, the, that's the difference. Like my parents, I remember telling them, they told me, you are black, but don't be too black. That's never going to be a conversation I have with my son because my parents knew what they, I had to navigate here because they they were first. They I was the first generation, so I knew they knew what I had to navigate. And I grew up in a you know I told you a white area. So, but what we've got to do is is things like this. We've got to talk more, and we've got to keep being open to speaking to younger people, black people, people of color, minorities, you know, female about unlocking that thing because all that shit is just what the construct that they've created it's not real like we can have it just the same as anyone else because like i read something today that 79 percent of millionaires did not invent in not did not in inherit a penny so they made it from scratch so the predominant you know really 75 percent of them sorry 75 of that 79 percent are white so i'm going 
they've just found a way themselves. Yeah, they might have had a bit of a cushion and whatever, but they have not come from money. So my view on it is that that's what we've got to start. We've got to start knowing that we can. And this is what I'm saying. The Jay-Z's, the Obama's, the Oprah's, we, you know, we've got a couple in the UK now, the Storms. You know, these are all million, millionaires, billionaires. We've got to understand that. We've got to start telling the young kids coming through, like, yo, find out what your thing is and just go hard with it. Like, and it could be that you are into science, just go hard with it. It could be that you're a talkative person who connects people. That's something. You could be a socialite, you could set networks up, you could do this, you can be anything that you want. And I think the, the that's what that's what I'm saying about your power. You've got the power to connect all those who are active, but you also got the power to inspire all these ones coming up. Because there's still no rule book, there's still no book out there that helps us in the UK for about what you're talking about, but you've got the information. On that note, we leave it there. <laughs> we leave it there. So that's something for me to really um, action on. Um, how can we find you? Obviously, we're going to put it in the show notes, but if you're listening, different sensory you know, stuff, how do we find you? Yeah, I think um, from now I'm on Instagram. I went back on in December. So Playmaker13, all one word, all phonetically. Um, or I am on uh, LinkedIn, Mr. Yao Wusu. Um, yeah, so either one of them, but like, yeah, Instagram is is probably the best place for me um, at the moment. Great. Connect. No harm in liking, no harm. Just connect because this is important. As, as you said, you know, this is investing in, in, in stocks. When when this blows up, yeah, okay. I'm not going to be as accessible when this is you. So I'm messing. But no, but the, the real thing is like we want to get the, the word out there and inspire someone who is doing their GCSEs or doing thinking about you know, when they're 13 or 14 um, in, in the UK, you, you have to do your choices. And at 13, I don't know what I was going to do at 13, but to have someone with conviction know that they can make money and they can show their parents, look, this person does that in music or that person does that in jewellery or that person did that in, in, in being a di digital creator. I can make a career. Don't push me into accounting. You know what I mean? <laughs> you could, I could save you 10 years of time. You know what I mean? Because I could, you know, with technology, that person can finesse their skills online from school age and not be in debt 100 cool we'll leave it there thank you so much no, thank, and, thank you for um, having me and, yeah and i really up, do keep appreciate up the great work. and the great work please connect with us on the podcast the black crepe handbook <laughs>